Let's do a quick review on the book of Joel. Joel, many believe, was written about 850 B.C., somewhere in that time period. He is contemporaries of his day, is Elijah and Elijah. And here's four things that kind of gives you a quick review and overlook what you missed last week of the beginning part of Joel chapter 2, that the locust will be a marker that it's at hand. What's it? The day of the Lord. That's the title there, isn't it? This is the phrase that Joel, through the Holy Spirit, coins. The day of the Lord. And he uses that actual phrase that it's at hand when you see these things. When you'll say to your children and your children's children, has anybody ever seen locusts like this? And, and they'll say, no, that's one of the precursors to that day. It also says there will be fires, as you see up there, will mark the coming of that day. And um, that's a little scary as we see we're having fires that the world has not seen in, in a long, long time. I was reminding back that you remember when uh, Chicago almost burnt down. How many were alive then? Testing, you shouldn't have, shouldn't raise your hand. <laughs> Nobody could be that old, all right. But, you know, back in the 1800s when Chicago had a big fire and, and they, they talked about the city burning down, that was a massive fire in that day. But for modern history, paradise here in California and the state of Australia, are these marks of the, the coming of the day of the Lord? Many believe it could be. The day of the Lord will have a trumpet warning. What does that mean? I believe that's, as we looked back last week, I believe that's the connection. Remember, Joel's whole book is a prophetic future look that mirrors so much of what we know from the book of Revelation. And so the trumpet warnings are in Re Revelation. There are seven trumpets. We looked at trumpet five and six last week. He describes in the beginning of, of chapter 2 a, an attack of demonic locusts that mirror those two trumpets in Revelation, um, the, tr the fifth trumpet and the sixth trumpet, and it's all Revelation 9 and part of Revelation 10 in that. All right, that's the review. If you're here catching us in here, this is a very powerful mini book here. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And he relents from sending calamity. I love that right there. That gives us insight to who the Lord is. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings. By the way, the grain offering, the drink offering, just a little commentary as you go along, will represent what in the future becomes the bread and the wine. Okay, you good. I see a word in that, so you, you remembered that part of it. All right, very good. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the assembly. Bring together the elders. Gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room. Let the bride leave her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people. Lord, do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should... They say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. Uh, there's something wonderful in the midst of when you look at futuristic tribulation and, and all the things that we see, the horrors of coming, when you still see the heart of God here, and in your notes, I call this section of your notes, the power of a purified heart. It really ties in what we ended with last week, the rendering of an individual heart, but this is also talking about the corporate heart, where a people turn, not just individually, but the nation turns. We know that historically when Nineveh turned because the king said, hey, his God can destroy us, so we're, he made not only the people, but he made the animals repent and not eat and fast and all that. And God 
blessed Nineveh and didn't destroy it because of their repentant heart. So there's three things that I see in this in verses 15, 16, and 17. A corporate fast and a sacred assembly is part of the equation. Fasting and coming together are two unique parts of what activates some powerful things of breakthroughs. When Jesus was teaching here on earth and, and uh, he sent out the disciples and he said, go out and heal the sick and preach to the poor and all that. They came back and they said, we couldn't cast out, we couldn't deal with some of these. And he said, some things take prayer and fasting. Fasting is a very important part where you're denying the flesh because you crave something of the spirit. Okay. Now, most fasting is a physical food fast. Today, a fast of noise, media, social media, news, all that may actually get you closer to God than fasting from food today because the, the whole element of a fast is a isolating from what is the natural so that you can be in the spiritual. Does that make sense to you? So where's all, you know, most of us, if we just give up food and we're still doing all those other things, you may not get the benefit of a fast. So I just want to give you that part. The sacred assembly is a time of people. In the old days when I was growing up, they, they called it the old fashioned prayer meetings where people came and they prayed until they felt like they prayed through. One of the churches in America that's a great church is the Brooklyn Tabernacle. They built their Tuesday night on the prayer meeting. And they started off with probably less than what we have here tonight. And they said, let's pray and let's make a difference. And they started praying for and seeing answers to prayer that take place. Very, very important part. I believe it's a strategic part for where the church needs to go to be able to make it here in the future. Verse 16 says, this kind of assembly, this kind of of spiritual awakening where we're fasting from the natural to move in the spiritual is a high priority call. That's why he goes, I believe, through the details. Call the elders, call the new moms, call the children, call the newlyweds out of their, their newlywed time. Come together and consecrate. Now, the consecration is us doing the rendering of our hearts saying, God, if there's any sin in us, he sanctifies, we consecrate. That's our role, is that we, we say, here we are. Point, point at something you want removed in my life, and with your help, Lord, I'll, I'll believe you can remove it from my life, okay? So that's this process that Joel is leading people through, and I believe it's a process that, that we will see activated in great realms as the world continues to go to hell in a handbasket the only answers are spiritual ones okay then verse 17 says there's a repentance the kind of like the cherry on the top is the repentance of the priest or in our day here it would be the pastors showing a broken heart over their sins and the people sins so it's that the pastors realize they are sinners and the people sins and that the the priests, the pastors are broken hearted over it. I uh, attended the renewal, California Renewal Project this week uh, in Anaheim, and um, I came under great conviction about how important uh, the role is of the church. When I heard some of the statistics of how many millions of Christians in California do not vote, now let's be honest, sometimes we're safe that some people aren't voting because they vote dumb. <laughs> you know, it's not just come out and vote, it's that you're gonna hear more and more from me that I'm not turning us into a, a political church, I'm turning us into the biblical church that you'll feel equipped. If you don't get my minute with the word on Facebook or an Instagram, Go on there and sign up. Just type in, in the little search thing, Minute with a Word. 
I came back from there and wrote to you what you needed to hear because you'll hear many Christians say this because they don't think in the spiritual realm. They only think in the natural. They go, how can you as a Christian vote for a guy like Donald Trump who's been married three times, he, he's claimed on television that he slept with every beautiful woman or at least dated every beautiful woman in New York. He builds casinos, that's what he did to make his billions of dollars, and you say he's fit as, for us as a Christian to vote for to be president? What's the answer to that? I wrote it on my minute word for you this week if you read it. Hebrews chapter 11, in the hall of faith where The chapter 11 of Hebrews gives us the spiritual insights into some of the Old Testament characters there. How did Samson get in the hall of faith? Was it his good choices with women? Was his ability to pay his gambling debts with the foxes that he tied the tails together when he lost the bet on the riddle? Hmm. So it wasn't his ability of choices of women. It wasn't his ability to fix his gambling debts. We know something with his hair. (laughs) Hmm. Had to play in it. The reality is Samson's listed in the book of Hebrews as a, a patriarch of the faith because in a time when there was nobody that was willing, Samson was the man that God had step up to defeat God's enemies and Israel's enemies. So in my minute word, you're getting it here tonight, it goes with Joel because you have to think with a spiritual insight. That's what this process that Joel's laying out is to get you to think more spiritual. Tune out the things, ask God to give you this kind of stuff. President Trump may be the only man that was willing to take on the enemies of God that God could raise up in this time. He has the hair like Samson. (laughs) He has the reputation of Samson with the women and the gambling, right? But he is the one that's defeating the enemies that killed the innocent babies. He is the one that is standing for the enemies that come against Israel and fulfilling the prophetic parts of Israel by moving the embassy and all the different things. He is the one that is reforming those that are hopeless in prison reform. He is the one that's giving every skin color an opportunity to get out of poverty. Hmm. Maybe he's the only one that could not care about a political system and go out and defeat the enemies that have been the enemies of America when America used to be the friend of God. Now you have the answer you need for every Christian that says, well, I couldn't vote for a man like Donald Trump in 2020. You know what? Jack Hibbs was there at, the, at this uh, time of, of being with uh, the pastors and stuff. There were 700 pastors at at the conference room there at the Sheraton. And uh, he shared with us that he said, you know, um, I'm saddened by this, that if America can turn around, can California? He said, everybody's written off California. He's, He's actually on the president's faith initiative board. And he said, just two weeks ago, President Trump was speaking and he was saying, I believe that with the pastor's help just preaching the book. He goes, I don't care if you preach the issues. Preach the book and how to help your people know how to see the difference between right and wrong. He goes, I believe I could win 49 states out of 50. And everybody in the room knew the state that he was leaving out was California. And Jack Hibbs interrupted the president and said, oh, please, please, don't don't leave out California. He said afterwards, some of the security guards and the Secret Services, uh, only hecklers yell out at the president when he's speaking, and we usually move them out, but because you're a pastor, we let you get by. But he said, the president wants to have some words with you. He said he took a big swallow and said, oh my, what did I do? And he said, you know, I've been talking with my own kids. California seems impossible. He said, but me becoming president seemed impossible. Maybe we should take a a harder look at California. 
wow, you know what? God deals in wanting to do the impossible. We're the great candidate for God to get glory. That, but it takes Christians voting right, voting smart, knowing how to answer the other Christians that want to be high and mighty like they never sinned in their life. That God could raise up a Donald Trump, a Samson for this day and time. Wow. Aren't you glad you came just for that tonight? All right, there you go. Probably the tea party wants me to come and share that one there, right? I'm, I'm more willing to do things than I've never been willing to do before. It is the day and hour takes for men and women to get a backbone. I'm saddened to tell you that the majority of my peers are afraid that people will walk out the doors because if we go down this path, they'll go, they're just, they just want to talk politics. No. I want to talk changing the world to the kingdom of God, and it takes knowing the things of God to direct people in that way. If you go through history, the Revolutionary War, the pastors were on the wrong side. If you go through the Civil War, the pastors were on the wrong side. They were silent. You get to World War II, where the Protestant movement started, right there in Germany. The pastors were silent, and, and one out of every three Jew got killed because the pastors were silent. You know what? On my watch, I'm not going to be silent. That's just where it's going to be. I'm, not, I'm still going to preach the whole Bible. You're getting everything. We're going to Ephesians on Sunday this, this week. I'm going to teach you how to be all that God wants us to be in the kingdom. All right. This is, to me, the foundations of the power of a purified heart. You do not fear what others say. You fear what God's going to say about you one day. They had, a, they had a man there from the East Coast up in the Boston area. His, his name is Ken Graves. And every time he spoke, he did that on the... And, and, and it just... And he was a bodybuilder. He had to be. He looked like he could have been Samson himself. You know, he had that deep voice and, and just that... Every time he made a thing of that, I thought, Lord... I got to get something that I can really thump and get that resounding thump in there so that it wakes people up in this. But what wakes a person up and what wakes up a corporate group is what the, right here, the description that Joel has given for this day of the Lord that's coming. It says that what God might hear. Let's pick up what God is going to hear and what happens if he does hear in verse 19 through 25. All right. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. I will drive the northern horde far from you, pushing it into the parched and barren land. Its eastern ranks will drown in the Dead Sea, and its western ranks will in the Mediterranean Sea, and its stench will go up. Its smell will rise. Surely he has done great things. Talking about the Lord. Do not be afraid, land of Judah. Be glad and rejoice. Surely the Lord has done great things. Do not be afraid, you wild animals, for the pastures in the wilderness are becoming green. The trees are bearing their fruit. The fig tree, the vine, yield their riches. Be glad, people of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given you the autumn rains because he is faithful. He sends you the abundant showers, both autumn and spring rains, as before. The threshing floors will be filled with grain. The vats will overflow with new wine and oil. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten, the great locusts and the young locusts and the other locusts and the locust swarm, my great army that I sent among you. Now I want to read verse 25 to you in the King James because it spells out the four locusts and this is an important part. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm my great army which I sent among you. All right. This is, this is really, really important, this portion here. I, I can almost hear, it sounds like after the sacred assembly, after the pastors repent, after the people learn to pray down the things of God. Remember, this Sunday, you don't want to miss it. 
I'm going to teach you how in the spiritual realm to pray a restraining order against that which is trying to move against your family, our schools, our counties, our things. I'm going to teach you how to pray that restraining order in the spiritual realm. I have a video of a, of a black pastor that God taught him this and what happened. And when I heard this, I thought, I'm going to start praying that. You know what? I had to use that restraining order prayer today. In the video you're going to see Sunday, it says it took 48 hours before what this woman needed to be restrained in her life that God answered the prayers. When I prayed that restraining order today, in less than an hour, what the person was asking me about, God delivered exactly because we restrained that in the spiritual realm. And God, it was like God said, see, Kevin, I, I showed you that a couple weeks ago. I told you to bring that in 2020 to the people. And now you seen it yourself that in one hour the restraining order why because he's the righteous judge we're not talking about a restraining order in the natural we're talking spiritual realms a restraining order in the spiritual realm that the evil cannot win when we're praying that's what you learn in the secret sacred assembly when we gather together to pray so you don't want to miss it. it's a three minute video during our prayer time this Sunday here we go seven things in here if you notice he said something twice in here whenever you hear the Bible say something twice he wants you to catch something and the phrase was don't be afraid if you have purified if you rendered your heart to God don't let fear come seven reasons why verse 19 says never again will the Christian or a Jew be an object of scorn to the nations and I put for your notes right there Californians take this promise we've been the scorn of the nation 50% of the homeless in the whole United States are here in California we have more drug abuse and drug deaths we I mean we're number one in all the scummy things we're ripe for God to show his mighty hand. Never again. There's going to come a time. I don't know if it'll come before the rapture or after Jesus comes the second time. But I'm claiming that, hey, God, you have me in California. This is, this is why I believe I'm here. There's a lot of people that are saying, I, I have my days marked and I'm going to be moving out of California. You know what? Let them go. Know your Bible. Gideon had 30,000 army ones, and God said, you got too many. He took them down to 300. Then he showed them he could defeat all the masses. Because when God's in it, he took them from 30,000 to 300. That's 1% of what the army was he had. He had 1% of the army that he originally started with. 1% is good enough to defeat any army if God's the 99%. So it's not going to be by our might, not by our intelligence, but our ability to call on the Lord. I'm excited for what's coming for California. I love that I have a president now that says, I won't forget California. As a matter of fact, it's on my heart. He's, he told them in the, in the last part of their meeting that he said, I've, I'm putting you now, Jack Hibbs, in charge of the faith initiative. Tell us how we can continue to move into California. I love it. I love it. You know, I, I, I don't know the history that well, but I do know that uh, there was a president named Ronald Reagan, the first one I voted for. He actually took California, didn't he? Hmm. Seems like ancient history. Not to God. Millions, an estimate 10 to 12 million Christians in California did not vote in 2018. If we could get 30% of that to get activated, 30% of that, we could win almost every election in every level if they would move for the right things of God's concerns. So we don't need the, all of them. We only need 30% of it. We could sway California. I'm going to start praying that way. How about you? All right. So number two, in verse 20, he says, God pushes back the enemies. These are the enemies before his second coming. What are the enemies before his second coming? 
It's spelled out in, in, by a prophet 100 years, 100 and almost 50 years later, Isaiah. The enemies are those that call good evil, evil good, light darkness, darkness light, sweet is now bitter, and bitter is sweet. That's the enemy of God, the falsehoods that are happening. And God says that he will push back these enemies so far, they're going to be pushed into the desert in the north, to a dead sea on the east, and to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. In other words, they're going to where they can't survive. That's what the idiom is when he's saying, I'm pushing them to these places there. Or allegory on that one there. I don't know that he, it stays true on all those things. Remember, an idiom has to be true all the way through all those things. All right, verses 22 through 23, number three. Don't be afraid is directed to all of creation. He goes through the land. Don't be afraid. He tells the animals, don't be afraid. He even tells the trees. Why? Because the canker worms, remember, out there, and the people. He hits every area of creation and says, don't be afraid. And why? Because, number four, rejoice in the Lord our God, for he has given us the former things and the future blessings. And he uses the analogy there of it's going to rain. I've given you the former rains, I'm going to give you the future rains, and I'm going to bless you. The rain is a symbol of God's blessing. He blessed Israel in the past. He's blessed God the church in the past, he will bless us in the future. And so that's why I put it in there. Well, Lord, let the spiritual blessings, let it rain, let it rain. And that's, that's why we don't have to be afraid. Number five, don't be afraid. I will repay you for the years the locusts have eaten. That is a promise, not for every Christian out there in the world, but especially for every Christian that has lost that they can say, this was stolen from me. This is what sin has done. This is what bad choices have done. And I've lived the consequences, even though I've been a Christian for this long. His promise is he's going to restore. Now, some Christians, I, I'm amazed. I, I speak to some Christians, and they've ne they go, I've never had the consequences of, of great sins. I, I got saved so early and I haven't, you know. So this is only for those that have had the locusts destroy things in your life. You can start claiming there's a restoration coming. I think we could claim it corporately that the locusts have eaten up California in such a way that we're going to say for all the years that the locusts have been in charge of California that God will restore us for that many years. Good stuff. All right. I, you're not convinced yet. Let's keep going. Notice the order in the King James is a reverse of chapter one of Joel. That's why I wanted to read the names of those locusts because he reverses it. The last one in chapter one, remember it went this progression. The first locust ate the leaves. The second one ate the bark. The third ate the trees. The fourth ate the roots. In this portion of, of it, when he says, I'm restoring, he starts with the ladder, that which ate the roots, the, it's coming back. That means then the trees and the vines are coming back. The leaves are coming back. The fruit's coming back. It's all coming back in a reverse order. It's coming back. Just little things you have to see when he reverses order. You go, why is that? It's part of the restoration process, all right? And then he says, a great army. It's God's army described by Jesus in what we just dealt with, Matthew 25, verse 31, in the parable of the sheep and the goats. When it says his great army is coming, remember, this day of the Lord comes before the tribulation. It's the precursor. All these signs that Joel's talking about, these are the pre things that you go, these things will happen, then you know his wrath is on his way. But at the end of this, he says, I'm coming back with all my angels. I love that. And that's what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 31, that he's, he's coming with his angels. He's coming to rule the nations. And that's exactly what Joel says. He goes on and he deals with the nations. That's what the parable of the sheep and the goat that we dealt with Sunday. It intersects, doesn't it? All right. Verses 26 through 29. I've been chatting at you a lot. Any questions on that? Nobody? 
You're either following along or it's so far, your guys are giving up, huh? Everybody still treading water? Clear as mud? All right. Mud's not that clear. Remember that. All right. Verses 26 through 29 here of chapter 2. You will have plenty to eat until you are full. You will praise the name of the Lord your God who has worked wonders for you. Never again will my people be shamed. Then you'll know that I am in Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and that there is no other. Now watch, he's going to say this a second time. Never again will my people be shamed. Now this isn't in your notes. I'm going to give you this here. This is just stopping right here. Two weeks ago, the faith initiative came together against the sexual educational stuff here in California that they're forcing down our throats in the public schools that little kids are, are really, their, their minds and their spirits are being abused and attacked by sexual images and things that you should not be seeing in the schools. They're teaching them about sex acts and things that I wouldn't, I'd be embarrassed to describe here what they're teaching grade school kids. The faith initiative went there and said, we're asking you to do this one thing. You're saying our kids can try to opt out and you make all these hoops for them to have to opt out of this education. We're asking you to reverse it. If you believe this is so important that kids know about the many different genders and, and how sex works so early and, and all the messed up stuff, we believe they should have to Parents have to have their kids opt in to get that, not out. That's all they asked. You'd think that would be a simple thing. No. They shamed the Christians for such ignorant thinking. That's the word shamed here is twice. And this is the promise. You'll never be shamed again. They shamed them before the vote publicly the Democrats that got up and talked, shame them that you're so ignorant, you don't care about your kids coming along in the 21st century, understanding the things that they need to know to make it. And it was defeated right along party lines. Not a single Democratic voted that, there, that we should be allowed that the kids have to opt in to get that garbage, not opt out and try to because when you opt out of it, they bring it in some other class that you didn't even know that you had to opt out of. They have so many deceptive ways of trying to destroy our kids. They shamed them before the vote. When the vote came over, they got up and they kind of rubbed it in the faces of those that were there before. They shamed them twice. As I was reading this, here's what I started praying. Well, Lord, this again brings us to California. The promise here, as I get our people start praying in this way, as we move in this way, We've been shamed twice on the protecting of the little ones. And this is what Jesus said. Better for you to tie a millstone around your neck and cast yourself into the deepest part of the sea than for you to harm one of these little ones. They shamed the Christians that went to try to fight for the little ones. God's going to get the final say. But it takes you and I continuing to do what we're supposed to do, and we fight it also in the spiritual realm besides in the political realm here. So I believe a great army. So here's what he goes on to say in verses 28 and 29. That's the shame part of it. Let's look at verse 28 and 29. And afterwards, or it shall come to pass, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Let me give you the three things, that very simple notes here in this portion. The outpouring of the Spirit. Number one, there's no exceptions. He lists everybody there. Your age, whether you're young or old. Your sex, whether you're male or female. He didn't put any other genders. Just want you to know. Your position in life. In the original Hebrew, it says, and your servants, and here it says your, your sons and your daughters, but it's, in there it says your servants and your handmaidens. So no matter how high a position, whether you're a king or you're a servant, even a handmaiden, you have the privilege of the Spirit being poured out upon you 
as this day is coming near. Hmm. If we're close and we're seeing all the signs, I've been praying, then God, raise up men and women. Can I tell you something? I can go wherever they invite me, but I don't get invited to that many places to speak. But you work and live in those places. You need this spirit outpouring so you can be a voice where you're at. I'll charge you up every Sunday, every Wednesday, and I'll speak from the, and shout from the rooftops every place I get invited to go speak. But I can't live where you already have influence. You have influences in schools. You have influences in the medical fields. You have influence in the business realm. You have influence in the media. You have influences out there that I can't get to. God never meant for the pastors to do it alone but to charge up the army with their marching orders. So let me tell you, march on. Amen? All right, so no exceptions in this outpouring of the Spirit. There's three modes. He gives some visions, and we need men and women of vision. I loved, you know what helped me? You know why I'm so charged up? I don't that often get to spend a couple days with men of vision. And these were Spirit-filled pastors that have visions that I haven't caught yet of how all this fits together. And to be able to listen to them and hear their vision, how, how God can and will work in this way, it super fired me. It brought me to tears several times because I said, Lord, I've been foolish to think that you probably wrote California off. And we're here to rescue the perishing. <laughs> You know, that's, that's kind of what, you know, it's like the Titanic's going down, Lord, and, and I'll get as many lifeboats as I can. And, and all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute, that's not the realm of faith. Do you know who David Brody is from CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network? He was one of the speakers. He was hilarious. He said, you know what? God had this little shepherd boy, David, that took on the giant. And he said, can I tell you, God gave me one night, he woke me up, he goes, I, I love being creative because I like teaching my kids. And he goes, this is my 18-year-old daughter, he points to her right down front. He said, I wanted her to be here. I wanted her to see 700 plus pastors and those that are hungry to do something for God to change a state like California. I thought, how cool. He said, so I rewrote the story of David and Goliath like David was Donald Trump. Oh, you think you're such a big giant. You're just a little man. You paid way too much for that shield. That sword. And you know that sword you got? I'm going to use it today and I'm going to, oh, I'm going to cut off your head. It's going to be a good thing. Oh, it's going to be good for everybody. It'll be a beautiful thing. And he says, and when I kill you, our nation will rejoice, other nations are going to rejoice, and our God's going to rejoice because, not because I cut off your head, but because you no longer get to defy the armies of the living God. And it'll be a beautiful thing. I love that. That's what we need is more people to see things through the eyes of God can do it today. He raises up a Donald Trump. He can raise you and I up to do what we're supposed to. The three modes is a vision, dreams. What, if a vision is men and women that have visions, it means they, they, they see the path. They understand the structures. They know what needs to go together. Those that have the dreams, they were the men and women that were there that allow me to dream a new dream about California, that I'm no longer here to rescue the perishing. The dream for California is that God would be so glorified that he could turn around a state like California. That's the dream. The vision is the path how to get there. Then he says he'll give those that will prophesy. Now the prophecy is this, is pointing him to the word, showing the pattern of how God did it in the past. He can do it again. And we ask God, God, if you did it for Israel in this way, if you did it for this nation this way, you can do it for us. That's where I come in. I will show them the pattern where God was faithful in the past. He'll be faithful today, and he'll be faithful tomorrow. Amen? Praise the Lord. Then uh, the, the last part of this 
in this that I don't want you to miss is the outcome, the indwelling of God's Spirit as a gift to humanity. But he says something that you and I don't catch in this, and I'm going to tie this in with our closing here tonight as we finish out these few in here, that what takes place here when he says, I'm going to do this on your sons and daughters, the fact that he said women will have visions and dreams and prophesy, and your sons and your handmaidens, your women, can be these things, Throughout all of recorded history, 2% were women leaders. 2%. So that means out of every 100 people, only two were women that were raised up to be leaders until the 21st century. In 2010, a report came out in church leaders that now around the world, Places of significant leadership, missionaries, chair women over corporate Christian boards, women pastors, that now there is 20% of all leaders in the world for Christianity are women. So it went from 2 out of 100 to 20 out of 100. That means 1 in 5 folks, if you didn't get the math. One in five is a woman leader. That's this prophecy in Joel that was given 2,850 years ago come into fruition in our day and time, that God is raising up. He'll pour out His Spirit because maybe men wouldn't all measure up, and so He's raising up the women in this realm, and I love that, that there are some very, there are some bold women there that I thought, wow, Lord, I see the anointing. I see the power of your spirit on that. All right, here's the closing of it. Verses uh, 30 through 32. I will show wonders in heaven and on the earth, blood and fire and bills of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Wonders in heaven. That's what I named this whole message for you here tonight. To me, to believe again, to dream, to have visions, even for our state, for our families, that we could push back the enemies that seem like they, they, they're entrenched so deeply and everything else, it's going to take a wonder of heaven. Here's the three things that I see in this. Verse 30, this verse was activated in our last decade, and it will continue until that day of the Lord. How was it activated? You saw the signs are out there, the sun and the moon and the stars. They came in the last decade that we just had. The signs. We're not going to take the time. I've given them out there so many different times. Verse 31. The when, the tribulation, is that dreadful day of the Lord. We're not in the tribulation yet. We could be in the precursor for sure. But this is about that precursor time. This is about the day is at hand, but it's not here yet. This is what can still happen because if you and I humble ourselves turn from our wicked ways, seek God. He gives the promises of everything here in Joel chapter 2 that you and I need to hold on. As a matter of fact, he uses a very powerful word, point number three, everyone, no exceptions, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is a reminder that none need to perish. Wow, that's the gospel right in there, isn't it? None need to perish. In the King James, it says, whosoever. You know whosoever is? It's everyone. That's why the NIV put the word everyone in there. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's our hope. Why not the end times start with a turnaround to show the mighty hand of God what can happen in a state like California? Why not us, instead of being the tail, we become the head? Instead of being on the bottom, we move to the top. Let's pray. Father, I've done the best. Uh, Lord, some were probably saying, what got into the pastor tonight? I pray, I pray that, Lord, as 
as we continue in these truths, as we continue in your word, that what you're placing in my spirit wouldn't just stop with me, but that there are men and women tonight that are going to go home and they're going to pray, I need this outpouring of your spirit. I need the power to have a, a vision or a dream or to understand the Hebrew patterns of how you do things. If you've done it in the past, you're more than likely to do it again in the present. Teach us your ways. Show us, Lord, for our world, our community, our state is in a desperate need. And because it looks impossible, we call upon the one who is the master of impossibilities. You heal. The impossible is where you get all the glory. I pray that California becomes the glory of God instead of the playground for the devil. We pray that what happened in this couple days with pastors gathered together in this renewal project, that those pastors came home the same way I came home, with your thumb in my back, and you're calling me to be a more powerful stance for you and your kingdom in these days. And I give you the praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen.